So this is a really special opportunity, Dr. Hoffer, for me. Uh, as you probably know, I've um, valued as have literally tens of thousands of uh, practitioners uh, from your work and your insight. And to sit down in your office here in Victoria, British Columbia, uh, and know that you're still practicing psychiatry at, uh, at the level of wisdom that you can bring to this discipline is, uh, is absolutely amazing. It's something that we all aspire to, to do in our own professional lives. And, uh, not many of us will be as successful in creating a whole new concept as you've created, but uh, certainly your model of uh, stick to itness and discipline and dedication to your patients is, is a model for all of us. So I'd like to just start, we can go all the way back obviously to before 1957, uh, but 1957 for me is kind of where I started my understanding of you by reading your first paper uh, published on niacin and schizophrenia. Right. So when I look back and I listen to your story, I'm reminded of so many interesting things. We could call them fortuitous or serendipitous or directed. So here is a person, in your case, that gets a PhD in a chemical field and understands about pellagra and niacin as it relates to an entirely different field and discipline from that of psychiatry, then goes to medicine and focuses on psychiatry, and then because of a creative mind, makes the connection. And as I recall in your paper, you were maybe the first group to talk about the similarity between pellagra's dementia being schizophreniform with schizophrenia. That's and correct. So that connection is a brilliant leap of abstraction to most people, but yes. for you was clearly obvious. It was so terribly obvious, I didn't ever think people would object. I thought that would be looked upon as a hero. I said, oh my God, they, they the guy they're going to love me now. By that time, I was very popular anyway because I was doing a lot of nonsense research that didn't mean anything. <laughs> and as long as I published papers that had no meaning, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. I was popular. But after we published that first paper that you read, guess what? They said, oh my God, that guy's a heretic. And at that time, of course, as you know, the tranquilizers came in in 55, 56, 57, and they, they were financially so rewarding to the big drug companies that they overwhelmed the whole field. And today, psychiatry is owned by the big pharma. That's what's happened to psychiatry today. So as you made this discovery, I find it extraordinarily interesting from an intellectual uh, development perspective that you took the, uh, the pre pellagris dementia connection to schizophrenia, and then you asked questions about, well, what other genetic metabolism disorders associated with nutrition can we think about that could have central nervous system effects, like hyperhomocysteemia. Yeah. And then you talked about B6 and B12 and folate. So your model got extended and it seemed to be able to be mapped against many of these conditions. We had these informal meetings and this was a fantastic amount of information. And that's where we brought Linus Pauling in. Uh, I remember we had our meeting in Vancouver at the home of Dr. Ross McLean. And and there I am, chairman of the meeting, and as a chairman, you're not supposed to do anything, you know. You're supposed to just sit there and be quiet and make sure things are running properly. So I'm listening to all my colleagues, there are 10 of us, reading their fantastic papers. They're talking about folic acid, they're talking about B6, talking about zinc, Carl Pfeiffer, everyone. They're all giving us some amazing information. So I said to myself, oh, isn't it fantastic? Here is this me very important information. No one hears about it. We have to publish it. So David Hawkins is sitting on my right, and he's a good friend of mine. And I said, David, I said to the group, <laughs> we have to publish a book. So they stop, and since I'm the chairman, they have to listen to me. That's the power of the chair. And I said, David, you are going to be the editor. And he gulped. He said, what? I said, don't worry, we'll help you. Each one of us will submit a chapter. So eventually David said, yeah, okay. He thought he would do it. So after a while, uh, we were starting to organize this book. So then it occurred to one of us, I don't know who it was, it might have been David, that maybe we could ask Linus Pollock to become an editor. I'm talking about the book on Orthomolecular Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So David, no, no, I think David wrote to Pollock and asked that. Pollock said yes, he would, on one condition. And the condition was that he would have to approve of every paper that appeared in that. So we, of course, said, fantastic. And that's how that book came out. So now you've talked about an epic chapter that uh, I think propelled this whole model that you birthed uh, forward, and that was the 1968 publication in Science Magazine by, uh, authored by Pauling of the uh, article Orthomolecular Psychiatry. That right. seemed to put the discipline up on the big board. 
Did that change the visibility for you of the what you'd been doing? Yes, all these it years? did. It gave it, the, <coughs> it it gave it the uh, it gave it prestige. It also gave us a lot of work. But I remember what happened because I I had not met Linus Pauling before then. But one day, apparently, he had been getting letters from a large number of Americans who had heard about the vitamin approach, and were putting themselves on it, and were getting some response. So he was getting more interested. And it fitted in with his own basic concept of molecular medicine. I think this had been gestating in his mind for some time. So one day I get a, I get a letter from Linus Pauling, dear Dr. Hoffer, and he said, I am enclosing a manuscript which I propose to send to science. Would you please go over to make sure that you are properly quoted? Now isn't that amazing? So then he came along with the word. Now at that time we had been playing with the word megavitamin therapy which I didn't really like that much because no such thing as a megavitamin. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And when, when he published his paper, I said, that's the answer. This term of Linus Pauling's covers almost everything that we are going to do. And since then, I haven't, heard, I haven't thought of anything better than the term orthomolecular. But even amongst my colleagues, they became very upset because they were getting used to the term megavitamin therapy. Mm -hmm. And we had, our own, you know, we had our own conservatives as well as liberals in our own group. And so, so I took on a major role. I said, I am going to defend the word orthomolecular and, 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 until it kills me. It's going to become the word. And since, again, I was chairman and I had some prestige, I was able to gradually force the word in. And, with, and uh, even with the, the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine, for many years people wanted me to change the word because orthomolecular is very unpopular. I said, so what? Of course it's unpopular, but we're going to change that. And thank God, Jeff. Well, let me just uh, kind of bring this to a close, saying that, um, you know, this concept of functional medicine that we've been working on for about 20 years now, uh, which tries to look at the presaging uh, direction towards disease before a person gets to disease, in other yes. words, the dysfunction that precedes mm -hmm. the pathology, is, is really rooted conceptually around the principles of what we call our founding uh, figures. You're one of those founding figures. You know, this work, this, this construct, not only does it pertain, obviously, to psychiatric and neurological health, but it pertains to the health of the whole body. This, this is a, a right. paradigm that you've advanced, right. along with, with Williams and along with Dr. Pauling. Th these, are, these are conceptual frames that change the way we view the patient in the exam room and how we will manage them. And on behalf of the whole Institute of Functional Medicine, I, I want to just personally thank you for the so many years of uh, tireless and uh, you know, self-sacrificing work that you put into this. And uh, I can say that your legacy as it pertains to this contribution will, will remain rich, bright, and warm, and we will continue to hold the, the banner that, uh, very high. We're going to fight these battles, and uh, we're going to get rationality and truth to prevail. So thank you. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's, a, it's a deep pleasure to share this time with you. Thank you. Well, actually, all in all, it's been kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs>